Okay, uh, welcome everybody at this uh, fourth QGIS Hydro webinar. And uh, really glad that you all are here and uh, found a subscription uh, button apparently. Um, so uh, yeah, we had about 110 people who subscribed and uh, I think some more will, will enter. We're currently with 42 people in the meeting. Uh, please keep your uh, mics muted and your, your camera off until we are at the Geo Beers. If you have any question, please put it in the, in the chat. Also use the chat to introduce yourself, your name, your country, your organization, anything else you wanna share and uh, feel free to ask uh, the questions. I'm gonna to switch to, uh, to the presentation. So I hope you can see my screen. We're in the fourth uh, QGIS Hydro webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, we really hope that you are surviving in these uh, COVID crisis times. And we really hope that you find these things useful and uh, hope that you, uh, you enjoy learning new things or extend your knowledge on, on QGIS. So I'm uh, Hans van der Kwast and I'm a physical geographer background. I studied uh, physical geography at Utrecht University. There I also learned a lot about uh, GIS and I did my PhD there on the integration of satellite imagery in uh, soil moisture modeling using data assimilation techniques. I started using Python there and uh, the PC raster Python framework, one of the first uh, testers of it. Uh, it's a great tool for uh, map algebra that we covered last time. Um, it's now integrated as a, as a Python library and hopefully in the future we'll get all those tools in, in QGIS. Then uh, I was a researcher at the Flemish Institute for Technological Research in uh, Flanders, the northern part of Belgium, uh, where I was uh, working for the environmental modeling unit. And uh, we were very happy to, uh, to switch to open source there a lot. And we even had a nice uh, working group on Python and shared the knowledge with each other. And uh, I was working there on water quality models, uh, land use change models. And in the unit, we also worked on air quality, uh, which seems to be improved in the last weeks for some. Uh, reasons. Um, since uh, 2012, I work at IHE Delft, the Institute for Water Education. It's uh, one of the, the largest uh, educational institutes on water in, in the world, where we have uh, students from all over the world doing masters. And I'm a lecturer there in eco-hydrological modeling, but most of the times I'm uh, working on GIS and remote sensing and, and Python. And uh, I'm also a board member of the Dutch QGIS user group. It was established uh, at the end of last year. And uh, it's great to have now a community in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, we'll also keep them posted. We'll have to do some things online also these days. My main interests are open source GIS and uh, modeling. And uh, like Kurt, I'm a QGIS certified instructor, which means that for every course that you, you follow uh, with me, you can get the uh, QGIS official QGIS certification, uh, which uh, donates per certificate 20 euro to uh, QGIS so they can improve the software. And uh, yeah, you have an official certificate and our organization uh, likes it to support, of course, uh, QGIS. So I'm very happy that IHG Delft uh, likes to support uh, QGIS. Uh, we also have a big uh, group on uh, remote sensing for hydrology, also one of my interests um, for water accounting and water productivity, very important tools. Uh, a lot of open data uh, that we process to uh, get water balance parameters. In my uh, project work, I work uh, a lot on spatial data infrastructures or SDI. And uh, I'm uh, advocating a lot for open data, which will be the topic of next webinar, because it also integrates nicely with, uh, with QGIS and we have some very nice examples to show you. And uh, yeah, as I say every week, we always uh, think that we are a bunch of nerds behind the desk. Uh, well, we are in the Corona times, but uh, uh, normally we also like field work and it's very important to know um, yeah, how data collection goes on in the field and uh, how to process that data and uh, and understand the data that comes from the field. So these things go together uh, quite nicely. If you uh, want to contact me, then uh, you can uh, send me an email or uh, uh, connect to me on LinkedIn, uh, look at Twitter or on Instagram and uh, watch uh, videos on, uh, on my YouTube channel. They're all about uh, QGIS and, uh, and Python, etc. So I'll give the word to uh, Kurt Menke. Hi everyone, uh, great to be here today. Um, I run Bird's Eye View, which is my own consulting business in Albuquerque, New Mexico, USA. I also um, have teamed up with a t uh, several core QGIS developers and trainers, and we call ourselves the Q Cooperative, and our goal is to provide QGIS support services. So if people need custom plugins or new features in QGIS or QGIS server, um, you can contact us there. I also run um, 
a program called Community Health Maps, which I'll talk a little about at the end of the webinar after Hans is done. And I do a whole mix of things. I do a little spatial analysis, some cartography, and some teaching. So I wear lots of hats, as they say. And um, I've written um, six different books on QGIS at this point, which is hard to believe. The, the most recent two, Discover QGIS 3X, which is a big 400-page workbook, which is a really thorough treatment of QGIS with 32 lab exercises in it. And then this book, which is the topic of this webinar, QGIS for hydrological applications, both of those with Locate Press. And um, I'm also, as Hans mentioned, a QGIS, QGIS certified instructor and generally um, a strong advocate for open source geospatial in general. I'm a, um, I, I helped revive the QGIS US user group a couple years ago, so I'm a, a member of that. Um, so if there's um, Americans in here that want to join that, um, you can hit me up and get on the, the mailing list if you're interested. I'm also an OSGEO charter member and um, my contact information's at the bottom. I have an email at Bird's Eye View and an email at the Q Cooperative and I'm on LinkedIn and GeoMenke on Twitter. So looking forward to the webinar and I'll be uh, helping on chat. If you have questions as we go through this, um, I'll try to keep up with all the questions as they appear. Great, thanks Kurt. So uh, this is a series of seven free webinars and they follow each chapter of the book, QGIS for Hydrological Applications, uh, published at Locate Press. And um, you can find a link to, uh, to the book page at the publisher uh, on the bottom of the screen. Um, it's uh, easy if you wanna do these webinars to have the book next to you and to, uh, to follow all the steps or to exercise uh, after uh, the webinar. Um, the first one was about preparing data from hard copy maps. Then we went into importing tabular data into QGIS. And uh, the third one, the last one, was about spatial analysis with map algebra. And today we're going to dive into stream and catchment delineation. That's like the masterpiece uh, for hydrologists. And uh, I'm eager to, to show you how, uh, how that works. Uh, next time we're going to talk about open data, as I already said. And then in the sixth webinar, we are going to calculate the percentage of land cover per subcatchment and some other great tools of QGIS will, uh, will be demonstrated. And then we will have the uh, final webinar on map design where Kurt will show us all the tips and tricks of styling a power of uh, QGIS. So I'm also really looking forward to that one. And I'm uh, very happy to have you all here. Uh, so from time to time, I have to admit people in the waiting room. Uh, from the waiting room in. Uh, that's the, uh, the only uh, disadvantage of this uh, setup, but uh, you just have to deal with that. I, I just fear to open it up for all. So uh, for today's topic, stream and catchment delineation, um, I'll just uh, talk you a bit through the workflow. Uh, the full lecture is uh, also online in one of my videos. So I'm not gonna give a lecture on the theory. You can, you can watch that. Uh, of course, I'm gonna mention uh, useful things during uh, the practice. So it all starts with downloading DM tiles. You have to mosaic them together, which means merging. You have to reproject the tiles because uh, you cannot not do DM analysis with uh, uh, the geographic coordinate system with latitude longitude coordinates. Then we're gonna subset the DM because all these tiles uh, might not cover uh, only your area, but much more. And these algorithms that we use, uh, use quite a lot of calculation power of your laptops and uh, your computers. Um, then sometimes you need to interpolate voids. These are missing data in your uh, DEM. Sometimes happen. In uh, our case, it doesn't, but uh, I'll show you where to find that. And uh, then we're gonna fill the sinks. These are depressions in your DEM artifacts that uh, we need to get rid of for hydrological analysis because all the water in a catchment needs to flow out to the outlet. Then uh, we're going to burn in the stream network if we have a stream network. In uh, our case, we're not going to do that, but I have a video about that. Um, that just ensures that your water will follow the existing stream network uh, when you're going to delineate uh, the catchment. Calculate the flow direction. And then we derive the streams. Define the outlet on those derived streams because we're making a, a model. And then uh, derive the catchment. And then whatever you need to do with your uh, delineated uh, streams and, and catchment, convert it to the data set for your hydrological model or make a nice map. That's what we're gonna do in the, in the seventh uh, webinar. So that's the workflow we're gonna follow today. 
And uh, yeah, I said the final map will be uh, made uh, in the in the seventh webinar, but uh, today we'll also show a few of those things um, based a bit on the time. And here on the right side, uh, it's also what I'm gonna demonstrate. It's a nice tool that we developed uh, with Lutra Consulting during the last uh, Hackfest in uh, Acarunia. Um, it's a tool to convert the flow direction that we get out of the Saga uh, tool uh, into a mesh and use the mesh styling options to get these nice arrows to uh, to show the flow of water over your terrain. And that's really nice. Okay, um, let's go to the practice. So I'm gonna switch to uh, QGIS. So we're here in uh, QGIS and uh, it all starts with uh, downloading your DEM tiles. And um, one way uh, of doing that, but it, in my case didn't always work, but I'll still mention it. I have a video where you see it working. Uh, that is the uh, um, SRTM downloader plugin, which simply downloads all the SRTM tiles in your uh, map canvas. So the area that you're zoomed in at. Uh, very useful. And it uses uh, the, uh, the credentials that you also have at the, the Earth Explorer website. So I'm gonna show the other method in Earth Explorer. So Earth Explorer is uh, from USGS and that's a place to find a lot of uh, useful data. And um, there are different ways of using the tool. I made a little video about that on uh, how to find a certain uh, area. The simplest way is just to zoom in on your area. This is a very nice agricultural area, by the way. Just here, the um, nice uh, satellite image, and you can say use map, and it simply uses the boundary of your canvas, and uh, you can use that then as the search area. That's one way. Another way is to uh, upload a KML or a shapefile. And uh, if you want to use a shapefile, then you can upload um, the zip bounding box. And uh, that will then give you uh, the area. As shapefile, as you know, is not just one file. Therefore, we also uh, promote a lot of geo package, but you can't upload here a geo package. But, uh, so you need to zip your shapefile before you can uh, upload it to this site. Then you go to data sets. And uh, for DEMs, you just choose here digital elevation. You go to SRTM and you check the box SRTM one arc second global for the 30 meter data set that has been uh, available for the whole world uh, since 2014, but the data has been collected around uh, the year 2000 with the space shuttle. You can also check those other options. When you download data, it's always very important to look at the metadata. So if you click the information button, you get a lot of information about the data. Okay, I prepared this, of course. We're not gonna download here a lot of tiles. So it will take too much time and we need our time. I also created a favorite already. Uh, I've demonstrated in the last webinar how to do that. So this is uh, from the book chapter and we see here the four tiles. We go to uh, layer properties, then I get some information about these tiles. I see the projection, it's uh, the geographic projection, latitude, longitude, and I give a minimum and maximum value of uh, of the layer and uh, that's available for all these tiles and I'm simply going to drag them into the map canvas and there we are. So that's another way of downloading it. You can uh, use the SRTM downloader plugin and it will download uh, the tiles for this uh, canvas. It's just a different uh, file format but that doesn't uh, change the workflow. It's the AG HGT files and this, this one will uh, add uh, the, uh, from Earth Explorer you get the geotiffs. So it's good to see where we are. So the quick map services plugin uh, always is nice to use to see on uh, OpenStreetMap. And uh, we're doing this uh, classic, at least for my students, classic catchment of the Ruhr. It's very nice for education because it has some nice uh, issues that we're gonna talk about in these uh, spots here. And then the first step in our uh, workflow is to um, mosaic all these tiles. So we do that under the raster menu and there are different ways of doing it, but here the most efficient way if you have tiles uh, of big files is use the uh, build virtual raster tool because then we don't really create a big geotiff already, but we use a virtual uh, layer. I uh, have to select all these layers except the OpenStreetMap. And I'm gonna click OK. We don't change this because they're all the same. We have to uncheck this box, that's very important. We use this for remote sensing images put each layer into uh, a band. In this case, we want it in the space to be merged. So very important. Then um, the only thing we need to do here is to 
save the file and uh, go to the right chapter here, chapter four. Uh, this uh, workflow is also very sensitive to file names and uh, folder names, so make sure you use underscores and no spaces and no strange characters, very important. Um, so I'm going to save this as the um, mosaic. Then I run the tool. And that's pretty fast because it virtually uh, mosaics it. And um, oops, sorry. there it is. And I always like to keep uh, the layers panel clean. So I'm going to remove those layers so we can't choose the, the wrong ones. And the next step that we need to do is to um, well, there are two things that we need. We need to reproject to a metric projection because the Z units of the DM are in meters, while the geographic coordinate system is in uh, latitude, longitude, in degrees. Um, and the other thing we need to do is to clip it to uh, our study area, which is much uh, smaller. I can show the, the bounding box. Here, yeah, that's the bounding box. And uh, we're going to work in the UTM zone 32 north on wgs 84 uh, projection you can always see those previews and, and choose the right one for your task um, this is a um, this is a trans boundary dem so therefore i don't use a national grid but i use utm a dem is a combination is a, is a term for a digital elevation model uh, which can be a digital terrain model or a digital surface model. In a digital terrain model, it's just elevations of the terrain. In a digital surface model, uh, we also have the objects on the terrain. So when you see this uh, very uh, high resolution uh, elevation, that's a digital surface model often. But in our case, we, uh, we have a, a raster of 30 meters and we are interested in the general uh, flow of water. And therefore, uh, we can consider this more as a DTM where over the 30 meter pixels, the elevation is averaged out. So uh, there are different ways of clipping the, the raster and reprojecting. I'm going to merge this in one easy step. So that's uh, the, the, different, uh, the difference with the instructions in the book. So what you can do is you go to the DEM layer, you click right, and you use the export function, and you do save as. And there I can uh, give it a file name. And there I'm going to call this uh, DEM clip. And uh, reproject it because I'm going to do it in one step. You see that I use intuitive uh, file names, so I always can fall back on uh, on the steps. That's important because in uh, in GIS you don't have undo generally, only for things that work in memory. But each time you save something, so if you give it a good name, then you can find it back where you went wrong to trace back. Here I'm going to use the coordinate reference system of the project, which is the same as the bounding box. If you hover your mouse over. Uh, the layers, not while I'm in this window, you can see the projection. I'm going to calculate it from the bounding box, the extent, and I'm going to fix the resolution to 30 meters. The SRTM one arc second product has a spatial resolution of one arc second, uh, which is approximately 30 meters on the equator, so degrees, minutes, seconds, and the seconds is then, uh, well, one degree is 111 kilometers on the equator, or one second is about uh, 30 uh, meters on the equator. So I'll choose that. And uh, for the rest, I can keep it as default, except the last one, no data values. I'm going to add here with a plus uh, an out of range value. And it's a bit of convention to use minus 9999. And uh, that's all what I need. Why do I need a no data value? You can see that um, the bounding box is uh, rectangular but uh, the DEM is in another projection and is skewed. So rasters can only be, be square in the end after reprojection. So I have to fill up uh, other parts with, uh, with no data. I'm gonna click OK. It's uh, processing and uh, it's below the bounding box. And if I switch off DEM, then we see here that is clipped and if I hoover, my mouse over it, I can see it's in the correct projection. I can also see the file name. So that went well. Then I removed the mosaic. We don't need that anymore. So uh, here, the next step is uh, for hydrological uh, purposes is to um, 
to make this hydrologically correct because there are a lot of depressions in it. What you can also have is that there is uh, voids. Those are areas that have no data values. We don't have it in this case, but I'm still gonna show you that. So I'm gonna open the processing toolbox. And uh, if you have voids, which are no data, then uh, you can spot them by putting a very dark uh, 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 grayscale or some uh, styling on your DEM. And uh, the parts that you can see through are the no data values. There are also other ways to, to check that. So I'm gonna search here for no data and there's this function fill no data. And then you choose the DEM, you can play with these parameters and uh, they will do it. I have a video on that. In this case, we do something else. It's called filling the sinks. And that's a typical hydrological thing that you need to do. There are artificial depressions in raw DEMs and the water gets stuck in it. It doesn't flow to the outlet. The other thing is that it also removes the real depression. So if they are important in your studies, then you need to put them in again. And then a very efficient algorithm is the fill sinks Wang and Liu algorithm. So um, make sure that you choose the, the right DEM. Therefore, I throw away the ones that I don't need. Uh, give it the output name. I'm going to save it to a file. And I call this DEM fill. And you can also output flow directions at this point, but I'll do that in a later stage. And also the watershed basins is not needed at this moment. I'm just interested in the, uh, in the filling of the sinks. And then I run the algorithm. It takes a bit, uh, you need good computers for this. Uh, 16 gigabyte memory is recommended. And then still it can take some time. And uh, if it doesn't work, you simply do it again. It can happen, it's probably memory issues. But this part's also very sensitive to, uh, to spaces. I don't have that in this case. And when I rehearsed this, it also gave the, the error. Normally it doesn't. And of course I'm multitasking quite a bit now with other uh, software. So hope resources are sufficient. Otherwise I'll take the one that I prepared already. See, it's getting a bit slow. Always a good moment to, to get a coffee when you push the button to calculate this. Seems to be working now. Yeah, there it is. Our patience is rewarded. So this is the filled DEM. And uh, if we uh, compare it with uh, the original one, and then we can uh, see that uh, that uh, the uh, that the pits are filled, and that's most clear at this point here, where we see on the OpenStreetMap that there's a big open pit mine, really huge. And I have a video where I demonstrate how to use the profile tool, which is very useful. I can uh, can quickly show that to you. So there's the profile tool that you can install, and that's to simply make uh, profiles in uh, QGIS. And uh, here, click on it, and I'm gonna add uh, layers. Click add layer here. So add the other one, the original one. Change the color, let's uh, make the field line uh, green. Okay, then I can simply draw a, a transect here. And you see the red line was the original uh, pit that we have in our DEM, and it's now filled up. So double click, you end the line. You can also open a, a, a vector file and you can save it as a PNG. Uh, lots of options here and you can see it traces live where you are on the profile. So very useful tools. You can add, uh, you can modify the X and Y, etc. It's a really cool tool, but that's what the fill sinks algorithm does. Um, then um, it's also nice to style the layers a little bit. Um, always good to see that a few times. So I'm gonna style this filled one. Go to the layer styling panel and I'm gonna choose a single band pseudo color. And you see default, you should not keep this. It uses uh, red to blue where blue are uh, the uh, highest uh, areas which looks like lakes. So that's not intuitive. But if you um, click right on uh, the color ramp, you can choose here create color ramp. And I can choose here CPT City, and then you get a lot of nice presets that can help you. So there's a nice preset uh, option for topography. There are some nice choices here, and uh, I'm just gonna use this one with elevation. And now we have the elevation one. And I'm gonna show you a few more uh, little tricks in that before we continue. I'm gonna duplicate that. You have learned that also in a, in a previous uh, webinar. And uh, this one I'm gonna rename because I'm gonna use this for the hill shade. And you don't need to calculate hill shade, there's a nice renderer for hill shade. So I 
choose here hill, uh, here hill shade. And uh, you can even change uh, the, the rotation uh, or the, the orientation of the sun. And uh, this is what it produces. And now if we combine it with the DEM and then use the other nice trick to uh, use blending mode and choose multiply, we can then get this very nice uh, effect. So that's, uh, that's nice. Another nice trick is uh, uh, you, you have to play a bit because the southern part of this catchment is, uh, is having valleys and, uh, and hills, but the northern part is quite flat. And if you want to see contrast there, there's this trick here to uh, use the current canvas and it will then, uh, if we move it, it will then update it for, for that part of the canvas. If we use updated canvas, it updates it every time. And um, you see here, it stretches the colors. And if we wouldn't do that, it will use it for the whole raster. And that's not working. That's funny. Um, probably do something wrong here. Normally it works. Anyways, this used to work. <laughs> probably not in a live demo. So try that yourself. Um, I'm going to continue with the procedure. We have now a style BM. And zoom to the whole layer. And the next step is to calculate the so-called Strahler orders. There are two ways to delineate your streams. There's to look at flow accumulation, but uh, I have another video on that to use the grass tools. Here I'm going to use Strahler orders, which is a more intuitive way, a nice way to do that. Saga has a nice tool for that. So make sure you use the filled DEM and you simply save it uh, as a Strahler order. File, Strahler, save. I run it. It is indeed a bit slower because I think the resources of recording the, the webinar and uh, the PowerPoint open, but uh, it should work. So the Strahler order is a method to, uh, to order your streams. It starts with the smallest upstream uh, pixels and then it starts uh, when they uh, come together, you add the order. If they're from the same order and if they're from different order, you don't increase the, the order. There's a nice video explaining that on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to style it. So as we discussed last time for these rasters, it's very important that you realize if it's discrete, continuous, or Boolean. Well, Strahler orders are, uh, yeah, what are they? They are discrete, but with a certain order. So it's on an ordinal scale, as we say. So I'm going to style it. And for um, discrete rasters and also for ordinal, we use the palleted unique values option. and because we have here uh, water, I choose blues for the ramp. And then I click classify. It classifies now the Strahler orders from low order to high order with higher blue intensity uh, as I want. It goes from Strahler order one to a maximum of 11. Um, some people think there's a maximum value. That's, that's not always, that's not a uh, standard. So it just orders it until it gets to the max. So there's not always 10 orders or 11 orders. It just simply depends on the extent of your area and uh, the ruggedness of your area. So we have now the Strahler orders. And now the trick is to choose a threshold value for which orders and higher than that order we consider as streams. And you do that a bit with trial and error calibration. And uh, therefore, I'm going to use the raster calculator like we learned uh, last time. I'm going to create Boolean maps. So I'm going to calculate first Strahla order larger or equal than, let's say, 5. So I'm going to save it, call it Strahler 5, to make sure that I remember which one has uh, which threshold value. And this uh, equation, remember, it means if the pixels in Strahler have a value 5 or larger, then the result will be 1 for those pixels, Boolean true else it will be false, Boolean zero. So calculate that, it's pretty quick. And uh, then I need to style it. So Boolean, as we learned last time, is like a discrete layer. We use palleted unique values. I click classify and it finds that we have these two uh, values in it. And uh, I want it as blue because it's water. And uh, I don't want to see the zeros. So I'm going to go to transparency and I add here the zero as an extra no data value and I'm going to hide the DMs. And the exercise now for the calibration is to compare if this Strahler order larger than five is 
representing well the rivers on this map. And the best way is to go from uh, upstream to downstream because these algorithms work better in the natural condition. But uh, we see that this is uh, far too many, much more than we uh, would uh, expect. So we need to increase the order a bit. So I'm going to do another one. I'm just going to do two for this uh, webinar. Not uh, Normally you try many and, and you search uh, for the best one. So I'm going to do larger or equal than eight. Save this, I'll call it uh, Strahler 8.tif. Yep, made a typo there. And I run it and there it is. And I can copy the style. And it doesn't copy the transparency, you have to manually do that. So I have to add here the zero value. There it is. So the difference between eight and five is quite uh, high. So you see here, this is with five, six, seven added to it. And this is only eight. And what we can observe is that in the natural areas, it follows quite well the streams, even where these uh, reservoir lakes are, uh, are human made. Then in urbanized areas, you can find these kind of things where the, the river has been uh, confined and, and channelized that uh, it follows it less. And uh, here in this mine, and that's of course because of the filling algorithm, we see that the river just cuts through the mine to reach uh, in the end the outlet because the water in the algorithms are forced to, uh, to the outlet, to the lowest point in the DM, which is around Remont where the Ruhr River gets into the Meuse. Okay, that's then also the, the next step. What we need to do is to, um, uh, to delineate uh, those streams. And uh, we use there for another tool, channel network and drainage basins tool, also from Saga. And that one needs your elevation. So make sure you choose the filled one. And it uses this threshold value of Strahler. So let's use here eight. Then in this case, I want the flow direction. So I'm gonna save that. And um, I'm not interested in the flow connectivity, the Strahler order we already had. The drainage basins are here twice. <clears throat> and what you need to find out is that this one is raster. You only find out when you're gonna save it. And the other one is vector, is polygons. See? So therefore it's here twice. So I'm gonna output not this one. I'm going to output the channels. So it's basically converts your Strahler 8 or higher to, um, to, uh, to your streams. I'm gonna call this uh, channels. So it will be a nice vector file. I'm also going to output the drainage basins. These are all the ba basins in the DEM that it can find just based on, uh, on the flow, on the flow direction. I'm just going to call these basins. And I don't want the junctions, so switch it off. They're all calculated. The ones you switch off are not uh, outputted to, uh, to the screen and are saved in temporary files. So I'm going to run it. And there we go. It takes a bit. It will uh, run multiple uh, parameters and then uh, output the things that we requested. It gives quite some feedback while you run it. You can see if things go, uh, go right. And there it is. I'm going to close it. There was another lesson last time. Don't believe uh, legends that automatically uh, come out of your GIS software. So we're going to do a little bit of styling. And uh, let's start uh, with our uh, channels. So I'm gonna zoom to layer. So here you see the basins layer in brown. That's just the default color. And it simply divides our DEM in uh, basins, in, in catchments or watersheds. And uh, we can already see here the Ruhr catchment. But we're going a step further. What we want is for a specific outlet to delineate the, the Ruhr catchment. So I'm gonna hide that one. And then uh, here are our channels, and I'm going to style that. 
And before you style it, it's always wise to look at the attribute table. We can learn a lot from that. So what this tool outputs is uh, several attributes, several fields. We have here order and order cell and the length of each uh, segment. And order cell is the Strahler order that was taken from the raster. So I said larger or equal than eight, so it will have eight until 11. This order, we classified them, so eight becomes one, nine, two, etc. And that's the Strahler order that you want to visualize on your map for the end user. So that's the one we are going to use. And we use there a, a categorized, no, a graduated styling. And um, we are going to use the order column. And I put the precision here on zero because it's uh, discrete integer numbers. And um, I'm going to uh, not use the color method, but the size method. So that they're gonna play with uh, the thickness. And we're going to use here a size from uh, 0 0.3 to uh, 1.0. And then uh, I can, um, I wanna change also the color to, uh, to blue. I can also use a uh, RGB value. It's a nice one uh, from the book. It's uh, 15 and 66 and 220. You go back. And then I click uh, classify and we still need to use the amount of Strahler orders that we have. So I can play here with the amount of classes. So I have eight until 11, eight, nine, 10, 11. So four classes to, uh, to put here the right uh, class boundaries. This one should be three. And that one should be four. And we have the four classes and uh, different sizes, so that already looks nice. Um, then uh, we can also uh, style our uh, flow direction map. That's an interesting one. And the flow direction map, that was something I uh, always wish to have a good styling for because uh, you can't simply assign uh, a random uh, ramp to that or uh, a gradient, a linear gradient. And uh, Kurt was, uh, was very helpful in the book to, to completely write out that uh, part that I think uh, nobody did before. And uh, the key is that we have here uh, the compass directions. And it's something uh, I want to tell you if, uh, if you work with uh, uh, these kind of tools, um, to always Google how your software uh, works with it. So different software uses different encoding for uh, flow direction. So if you want to look for something, you start your search with QGIS and you see I already wrote it, flow direction legend. And normally you end up then at the Stack Exchange uh, website. And uh, I asked this question some uh, years ago. And uh, yeah, then uh, somebody who is not very helpful says, uh, check the, read the freaking uh, documentation as if I didn't do that, but it's not well documented. You can't find that. Um, so fortunately, there was somebody very helpful there, uh, Christine, and uh, this person told me that for Saga it's encoded in this way, so zero north and then clockwise, and uh, for grass it's like this, and ArcGIS does one, two, four, eight, etc. PC Rusters uses the arrows on your numeric pad. So it's really important that you know how the flow direction is encoded. And it uses the compass directions. And um, so we need to style this, but not with the normal uh, gradient ramp. So I'm going to, these are discrete values. So we use palleted unique values. And uh, I'm going to use here uh, the spectral ramp just as a starting point. Click classify and there you find the values zero to seven and 255. 255 is, uh, is for flat areas like minus one in, uh, in ArcGIS. And uh, now I want to modify this uh, um, this ramp in such a way that we get a circular ramp. So I'm gonna click here and then we can edit the ramp. I'm gonna first remove, by the way, the 255 and add that in later. So um, now I can modify uh, the ramp and you see here four uh, different, five different stops. So that's uh, goes uh, clockwise, north, east, south, uh, west and back to north. 
and I can here change the color of the first one to the last one to make it circular. So if I click here on the color, I can use here the, the color picker and I can sample uh, then uh, the color, I have to click it of course, and then that one will be assigned here to the first one. So we've said that. And also the idea to make it intuitive is to have uh, warmer colors uh, towards uh, where the sun gets on the, on the hills and that's on, uh, when they're exposed to the south or the flow direction is to the south. Uh, aspect and flow direction are very similar algorithms, uh, almost the same actually. So I'm gonna use the, the colors that were recommended uh, by, by Kurt. So we're gonna use for uh, south uh, yellow. So I'm gonna click this and then I can uh, put here uh, the yellow in. Now it's completely yellow. Then for east, I'm going to use uh, green. And that is simple, simply R on zero, green on 255, and then blue on zero. And then we uh, use for uh, west, we use magenta. And there we have 214, 60, and 170. And uh, this gives us a nice uh, ramp that is uh, circular. So do okay, then it's applied. And I need to add in um, back the value 255, which is uh, flat. So you can, uh, can type the compass directions here. I'm not going to do that for the sake of the time. Uh, you can play around this uh, with this to, to make it better. You can uh, blend this with other layers and uh, well, this uh, makes it a bit more intuitive. But there's something uh, different that you can do, and that is also what I want to show at this point, is to use the, the Crayfish uh, plugin to uh, style uh, this uh, raster. And uh, I see already that uh, my computer is quite busy, so I'm going to make a subset first, so you can also see that. Um, I'm going to uh, make this flow direction map a bit uh, smaller, clip raster by extent. And I'm going to use, select the extent on the canvas. I'm going to, to select an area which is here. And uh, I always use here you know, data value just to be sure. And I'm going to save it to flow deer clip. Oops. And click save, run. Okay, now I have a smaller version here and I'm going to use that one uh, with the Crayfish plugin. So here in the plugins, Crayfish has, uh, has been uh, made by uh, Lutra Consulting to deal with mesh layers. And when I saw how uh, nice it was uh, dealing with uh, visualizing these meshes with, uh, with even arrows, I thought that it would be nice to have that for the flow direction. And during the Hackfest in uh, Acarunia, the name of this QGIS version, by the way, uh, we made it together in a few days. So um, you can find it then in the processing toolbox. Um, the Crayfish plugin is here uh, with a, a tool. And we're interested in this conversion tool, Saga Flow to Grip. I double click on it and here's our clipped file and it saves it to a mesh format, a grip file. And I'm going to call this Flow Deer Grip. I'm going to run it takes a bit, it just changes it to a different format and it doesn't automatically open. So what I'm going to do is uh, get it from the browser panel. I need to refresh it. And there you see with this symbol that it is, uh, this one is the, the mesh layer. I'm going to drag it there. It takes a little bit to load and then it uh, offers us all these uh, mesh styling options. There's a nice uh, video also uh, showing this. And there it is. We need to tweak it a bit. So I'm going to, um, style it so when I click here the layers panel adapts to the to the mesh option because it recognizes this is a mesh and I want to switch on the arrows I don't want to show the contours and I want to show the vectors in a nice way so I still need to do a few things here so I'm going to zoom in on the area to just have a, have a look I'm going to uh, Hide here all the layers, except um, it would be good to have the DEM under it. 
and you see that the density of the arrows is, uh, is a bit too, uh, too high, so we need to, uh, to modify this. First, I want to put it to a fixed uh, length, and um, we can play with these, uh, these values. These, the length is uh, far too high, so put it on, on 10, and it starts adjusting now. And here we see uh, the arrows. We can still make this a bit smaller, 0 0.1, and um, let's put this one on uh, 20 maybe. Five here now it becomes uh, more visible as arrows uh, in the flow direction. But an, a better way to uh, display it is to use these vectors uh, fixed on a grid there, and that's really a nice tool. And you can change uh, the spacing of the grid. That's also very dependent on the, on your uh, zoom level. So if you put them wider apart and on a coarser level, it's uh, clearer. So that's a very nice way of uh, visualizing. Uh, the flow direction. You have to play with this. This in a live demo, uh, a bit hard to, to fix all these things, but um, you can already see the effect. And if I put the channels there in, then you see that the water flows uh, generally to, uh, to the channels, what it should do. Very nice, this. Okay, um, then we are not there yet because we need to delineate our uh, channel, our uh, catchment based on an outlet. So I'm going to zoom to the layer and uh, back the open street map layer you see the the blending is on because i don't have the, the hill shade now underneath uh, that's also not so important i'm also going to remove the dm so because of the urbanization and the modification of the area our outlet is not where the ruhr exactly enters the Meuse river and we made a model the dem has been modified to, uh, to make this model where uh, the stream is. So I need to move the outlet to the delineated stream, otherwise it doesn't delineate the catchment. Um, I'm going to use this tool, which is called uh, Upslope. And that's basically the tool that delineates uh, the catchment. And it needs the X and the Y coordinates. And uh, in the first uh, webinar, you've seen uh, that we used the coordinate capture tool. So in this case, you also use that. We get this uh, coordinate capture panel and I can choose start capture. And then I'm going to choose a nice point here on the delineated river. It needs to be really in a 30 meter pixel. Another way is to digitize a point and snap it to the line. Uh, but here, this is also uh, sufficient uh, as long as you're zoomed in well. I'm going to copy, uh, remember the first coordinate set is in a geographic coordinate system and the second one is in the projection of your project on the fly reprojection. Copy this and the second coordinate, here we are. And make sure the fill DM is selected. I'm going to use the D8 method, which looks in the three by three window to the steepest slope uh, downward and we'll assign that uh, as the flow direction. Uh, these ones are uh, more uh, complicated algorithms that uh, take into account more directions uh, and they work better if you have diverging slopes. But here we use the simplest solution as a, as a first try and you can experiment with the others for your study areas. Then um, I'm going to save the file as uh, catch raster. run it and then it should uh, delineate all the upstream area pixels but in raster format and then the next steps what we are going to do is to um, make it into uh, a vector layer so we have a boundary polygon there's a little surprise for you also uh, after this webinar i'm going to open up a nice video on uh, automating this procedure using the graphical model so keep an eye on uh, on that you can uh, partially uh, automate this and um, it's here, so I'm gonna, it looks a bit strange, but I'm gonna zoom to the layer and then you see that it has been uh, delineated. If I sample the values, inside the catchment is, gets value 100 and outside gets value zero. It's good to remember. And, but this is not very useful also not to present or to make nice maps. So I'm going to convert this to polygons. And here under raster uh, conversion, we can choose polygonize. Use the catch raster indeed. The DM, that will be the name of uh, the field in the output uh, polygon 
uh, vector file. I'm going to save it. I will stick to the to the shape file just in this case. I'm going to call this uh, catch. And uh, this, DA, uh, this eight connectedness means that it should also look for uh, pixels that are connected in the in the diagonal to uh, to fit the lines of the of the vector. Uh, if you uncheck that, then it's the four uh, rule where it's only horizontally and vertically connected. So you can also play with that. There we go. And. Um, here we see uh, see the boundary polygon, and I'm going to inspect uh, the. Uh, I'll get to those uh, questions later that come in. Otherwise, uh, we don't get through. Uh, but it's easy to get back to those questions in the end. Um, what you see here, and that's important, is that there are several features with value 100. So if you select them, you can see which they are, and many don't show up, but they are there. I'll show you why that happens. And this is your catchment. And this happens. If I click here on zoom to selection, also a nice tool, then we see that there's one pixel here in a little loop. And that's a geometrical problem caused by polygonizing a raster. This is an artifact of polygonizing rasters. Um, so uh, in our uh, attribute table, uh, we need to get uh, rid of those. Those re don't really change our uh, boundary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select only the one that is our uh, catchment. I'm going to zoom to the full layer and go back to the attribute table. And I switch to editing and there's this nice tool to invert the selection. And I'm going to throw away everything that's then not the catchment. So we only preserve value 100 and then I uh, save it. And uh, there it is. So, now, just a few steps uh, to be done is to, to style this. And uh, what we can do is just a simple fill with an outline, simple line. And I leave it to, to Kurt to show uh, in, the, in the seventh webinar, the, uh, the shape burst fill, I think. I think that's better in the sake of time also and to answer your question. And also this, uh, this one is not really about uh, styling. Um, so simple line and then, uh, Make it a, a red boundary, make it a bit thicker. So here we have our catchment boundary, the rivers with the strata orders, and we can have our DEM blended with the hill shade. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a nice map. And uh, we can still clip uh, the streams. There's also something I want to show because that can cause an error which you can also fix, and that's also important to know. So vector um, clip, and I'm going to clip the existing big channels to a smaller one fitting to the uh, catchment polygon. Always make sure you're in the same projection if you clip the things. I'm going to save them, and I'm going to call this uh, channels clip. Run it didn't give an error, that's good. And um, we have those uh, other channels here. So I'm going to copy the style and paste it then to, to this one. And I'm uh, going to remove this. And then we have the channels uh, just inside. And we can also clip the raster. There I might expect some uh, errors which we are going to fix. So um, extraction uh, clip raster by a mask layer. Input layer is then our filled DM, or if you want to use the original, that's also possible because it's for visualization, you want to maybe use the real one. Then um, the mask layer is the catchment polygon, the same projection. I'm not going to chase anything of this. Change the no data value. I'm not going to change anything there. And then I save the clip one. And this I call the um, clips. I run it. 
and it worked. So it's a bit robust uh, in this case. Uh, sometimes you get a geometry error. Unfortunately, it didn't show up, but if it shows up, then uh, in the book, we have a solution of calculating a buffer of zero, but a very nice other way of doing it is uh, go to the processing toolbox. It's related to that issue with these, uh, these single cell uh, polygons, because you can clip only with, uh, with a full polygon, of course, with a good geometry. So in the toolbox, there's this nice tool called fix geometries. And there you can fix it for the capturing polygon, which is causing the problem. So I see many of my students fixing the channels. The channels are not the problem, it's the polygon. And uh, then, uh, then it normally works. Uh, I clip this, so I can also then uh, copy the style of the filled DM and uh, paste it to the clipped one. Switch off this one, and uh, there it is. Um, and then a little thing to show is the 3D viewer because we have a DEM here. So I'm going to zoom into a certain area here. Uh, I can also show you to get a bit rid of these uh, pixels. It's uh, caused by uh, resampling, uh, lack of resampling in the, in the hill shade layer normally. So we use nearest neighbor if we do uh, resampling for calculations, but for smooth visualization, it's always better to use uh, bilinear or cubic. And we see that it smooths then a bit. Yeah, that's for the zoomed in. And then uh, especially at distance, it looks uh, nice. Now, if I wanna view this in the 3D viewer, I go here to view, new 3D map view. I'm not going to go to the edge of my, the performance of my laptop in this live demo, but you can see it in my videos. Um, just make it a little bit bigger. What's important is to set the source of the elevation, that's your DM. Oops, sorry, uh, yeah, DM. And there I choose uh, the, in this case, the fill DM. You can use the clipped one and it's even uh, smaller. That's this one, the last one that, we, that I clipped. Um, the area is not super mountainous, so I exaggerated three times. You can play with these things to get a better quality. I'm just gonna start it and it takes everything from the 2D view in the 3D view and starts rendering and then I can turn it and fly through it. It's still uh, rendering as you see. And uh, yeah, that's a uh, very nice stuff that you can uh, use the 3D viewer. You can get these, uh, these white things out of the way. Uh, first of all, it needs to render the full thing, but also to play with those uh, variables. If you have a Google satellite or OpenStreetMap on top of it, you can see it. And even those uh, arrows, I'm not gonna challenge uh, the system now to do that, but uh, you've seen that in my posts uh, today, how to do that. So that's what I wanted to show you. So I'm gonna switch back to, uh, to the plenary where we can uh, handle some questions before we uh, continue. So I stop sharing this. So Kurt. Um, yeah, so there, there's a good question here from uh, Piotrek asks, can I set the maximum catchment area? I'd like to divide an urban area into many similar or many smaller catchments, for example, one to two kilometers each, and then cut the raster with them. And I guess this is possible in the Arc Hydro tool in ArcMap, where you can kind of specify a maximum size for a catchment area. And, and I was thinking you could do this by adjusting the trailer threshold, but I don't know if you have a... a yeah, that's one way. Uh, but an easier way or more comparable to Arc Hydro is to use the other approach with grass mm. uh, because there you play with flow accumulation to determine these things. So you simply uh, choose another level of, strong, of uh, flow accumulation. It's also the example in my theoretical uh, uh, video that if you change that value, then uh, you can tune uh, the size of the catchment because uh, when less flow accumulates, it's a smaller catchment. So these thresholds you can play with, certainly possible. Other questions that came in for the plenary. There was a little discussion about the fixed geometry errors. And um, one thing I was, wanted to explain, because it may be easier to explain than type in the chat box, is that um, the toolbox has this mode called edit in place now. There's a little um, kind of folder looking button in toolbox with a little pencil icon on it. If you press that, it filters the tools in toolbox to those tools that can be run in place on a layer. And one of those is fixed geometries. So it's really nice because if you have a layer that you have geometry errors in, you can just put the toolbox into edit in place mode, run fixed geometries on it, and it will just fix the errors without having to create a new copy of the layer, just fixes them in place. That's a great suggestion for things you don't want to keep, like uh, 
like also this virtual layer that I uh, used in the beginning. Scratch layer is also very useful just to try out things or only use it as a temporary input. Um, here's another uh, data source question. Is SRTM 30 by 30 the best high resolution DEM data that's free online or is there a higher resolution available? Well, free and online are the boundary conditions. Um, SRTM has been for a long time uh, the best. There are some newer ones, but with a lot of restrictions only for educational use, like the, the ESA one or DLR uh, one, very, uh, you have to fill in forms. And uh, yeah, that's not really what we call open data, but if you do some effort, you can get it. Um, there's also NASA has been combining different uh, data sources. Uh, I've seen posts of that. Uh, it's still my plan to make a bit of a summary or have an intern figuring these things out, but there are some more data sources out that combine uh, the Aster GDEM in parts where SRTM is, uh, is performing less. Um, yeah, so keep an eye on it, things will improve, but uh, generally for these kind of uh, applications where we are, need a DTM for general flow in a catchment, um, this is really a, a good DEM. And many students, they write in their reports like, oh, the DEM is outdated. Well, outdated DEMs, uh, that takes geological time uh, on this scale that we look at. Huh? It's not about humans uh, changing some uh, part of a pixel. We, we can't see that in these DEMs. The mine, of course, is an exception. And that's also something we are going to look at in the next chapter that moves, that mine is moving uh, through time. And we're going to compare satellite images and other sources to see that. But generally, a 30 meters DEM was like a uh, luxury uh, 10 years ago where we had 90 meter or the, the G topo one of one kilometer. And that was also even sufficient for these kind of exercises. So I know for engineers, that's always a difficult thing. You want to have the, the max on resolution and, but resolution is also not the same as accuracy. A statistician I always teach you by students will say, oh, larger pixels are better because the errors average out. So never confuse accuracy with, um, with spatial resolution. It's, it's not, it's a different uh, dimension. Right now there's a question I'm trying to answer about the different methods available in QGIS for filling sinks. And so I was just mentioning that there's several different saga algorithms out there for filling sinks. Today, Hans showed the Wang and Liu tool. Uh, there's also a grass tool. Um, what is it? R, R fill yeah. dir, R fill dir. And uh, yeah, the difference is uh, they all work a bit differently, but uh, the nice thing about open source is that you get different tools. So I always say use them and uh, compare and see what gives the best results. Uh, Wang and Liu is well documented, it's a scientific paper and uh, it's very efficient. If you have a very large data set, then uh, you see already with a lot of things on my uh, laptop, it takes a lot of time for this catchment. Uh, but there's the Wang and Liu XXL that's recommended if you have uh, many, many tiles of SRTM, for example. Um, so yeah, you just have to try them and figure out from uh, uh, from literature how they work and see which one works best for your conditions. If areas are very flat, you also need to work with the parameters in in the algorithm, like the the minimum slope in the in the Wang and Liu algorithm. Hey Hans, uh, do you know the difference between the, the three different Saga fill sync algs? No. No. Nope. No. Uh, I I always recommend to start with the with the Wang and Liu one, because that's considered as uh, the most efficient and, and well-documented best one. The, the, the issue with the, with the Saga tools, it's sometimes very hard to, to figure out uh, how they work. You have to really reverse engineer uh, a lot of things, uh, unless you can read the code, which is sometimes also not super clear uh, on, on, the, on the specifics. I often get that question for cringing. There's some, some person stalking on my YouTube channel and making remarks about it. And I thought like, okay, now I'm really challenged. So I'm gonna figure it out. But, yeah, it's, it's too hard and you don't know what every parameter means. So you have to try and try it yourself and figure, figure out like I do. That's, that's important. Try it. Yeah, there's a question here too about how many times you should use fill sinks. And it seems to me that you should only have to do that once. But um... Only once. If you want more advanced fill sync uh, algorithm, then definitely you have to look at PC raster works in Python and uh, there you can put all kinds of thresholds, how much volume of water need to be added, uh, the overflow, uh, the area, et cetera. And uh, it has like four or five parameters. And especially at this rural area, that's interesting because do you want such a mine to be filled up uh, if you still want to, to monitor what happens with the hydrography? Um, I have a video on that, of course, uh, that you can watch, but that's, 
something that I really wish that those tools are integrated in, in QGIS also from the PC Raster uh, Python library so you can use those and they're very well documented. Yeah, so that, that's another thing. Um, there's this webinar, but Hans does have a whole YouTube channel um, with a playlist for um, hydrological models. And uh, so he has, a, he has a YouTube video on, we're running through the workflow he just did with grass tools. He has, um, you know, one that goes through just um, the way the book does it with Saga tools like he just showed. And he has one on the theory behind all of this. So there, there's a lot up there that you can use to uh, take a deeper dive. And the whole procedure in, in Python with PC Raster. So uh, and, uh, yeah, more explanation on all these tools. I would put, I always put cards in these YouTube videos of the webinar so you can simply click to it uh, to, to find those videos that we mentioned here. Any more questions from the audience? Or do we continue? Oh, is it possible to export the coordinates of the streams in XYZ, XYZ text format? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There are there are tools um, for exporting, you know, pulling the vertices out of lines. Um, you could also first um, use the point sampling tool to get the elevation of vertices from those. So you'd have X, Y, and Z coordinates for them. So it, it, it's certainly possible to do that. Another nice tool for uh, hydrological modeling or analysis is the QChainage uh, tool, where uh, many of people, uh, many people ask me, uh, is it possible to sample on the on the river every uh, hundred meters or something? So QChainage tool can do that, and then you have a vertex on every hundred meter, and then you can use that in the in the point sampling tool to get the elevation, and you can make a nice uh, profile along the river, for example. So these are also nice tools to use. Yeah, and this can be where um, some of the uh, expression engine in QGIS can be really handy because you can, um, you know, there's a dollar X, dollar Y functions for, for populating attribute columns with the X and Y coordinates, for example. And there's also a, a point sampling function. I forget what it's called off the top of my head, but there's a, a function in there that allows you to um, uh, basically calculate an attribute column in a point layer by sam getting the sample, you know, sampling, you know, the, the value from a raster layer. So there's some nice functions in there you can use to do some of that kind of work as well. Lots of options, any more? We can also discuss over the geo beers a bit uh, later. So can we go yeah, to that, the last uh, that's, slides. That's all I see on here. Okay, let's uh, continue with a few slides and then you guys must be super thirsty either at breakfast, lunch or uh, dinner or beer, beer o'clock like I am. Uh, so I'm going to switch to uh, back to the presentation. So uh, what we always do at the end of the webinars is uh, give you some information where you can find additional materials. Uh, a few were already mentioned, so I don't go this time too much in detail. You you can find it on uh, on the website. The webinar and also has has a tab on the, on the open open course our website. The locate press link uh, guides you to that. So keep an eye on that. There will be uh, also the videos posted. Uh, and you'll find more free course materials over there. So gisopencourseware.org is the, is the main link to get there. And uh, I have a YouTube channel, as Kurt already mentioned, uh, with nice playlists also, a lot of theory, but also practice. You can also register for a short course uh, on QGIS at IHG Delft Institute for Water Education. Kurt has been uh, uh, invited as a guest lecturer in the past few years, and it has been great fun. Uh, we do mapathons and uh, have a good time together with GIS and really nice uh, full uh, full time course uh, where you also get the certificate. And we also offer online courses, and uh, we are working on one on this uh, book, a complete online course with all the chapters and, and with questions, quizzes, and exams in it. So also keep an eye on uh, those developments. I give the word to uh, to Kurt. Oh yeah, um, so just a couple of shameless plug slides here. I just wanted to um, quickly mention this community health maps resource. Um, I'll be posting more and more content to this. It's been a successful program that basically shows public health workers how to implement um, open source GIS workflows. Um, so very um, approachable material and there's already a series of lab exercises up there. I'm also gonna be working on getting um, a two-day course I've developed on vector-borne disease surveillance with QGIS posted up there so people can go through that. Um, and um, this came out a couple of weeks ago, but um, I'm a podcast addict myself. I love podcasts. And so if you like podcasts, first off, this is a really, like one of my favorite geospatial podcasts. It's called the Mapscaping Podcast. 
And um, the creator, Daniel O'Donohue, um, interviewed me about QGIS and the QGIS project a couple weeks ago. So if you want to give this a listen, it's episode 50, and the link is at the bottom of the slide down there. So, um, yeah, hope you enjoy that if you give it a listen. Yeah, that was a great uh, podcast. Nice. I like them too. Okay, uh, next week we are going to talk about open data. It's also one of my favorite topics. And uh, yeah, now we have delineated this catchment. How are we going to populate it with useful data for our uh, studies and to understand the catchment uh, and the dynamics better? Uh, and next week also, Kurt will uh, talk a bit about the community because open data also relates to community, but QGIS also relates to community. And uh, it's a very nice community. So uh, yeah, Kurt, do you want to say already something about it? I, I think the community is one of the things that I um, keeps me coming back to QGIS more and more is just uh, it, it, there's a, it's a really welcoming place. And I think one of the important things about an open source project like QGIS is that if there's something you don't like, if you find a mistake in the documentation, for example, you can change that. And um, so all, all of this is um, something you have, you, you can kind of take the initiative on and contribute to and work on. So I kind of encourage everyone to um, get more involved in the project as you can, even if that's, you know, you, you can have your own local QGIS user group, you can, you know, take a deeper dive and, and start contributing to the documentation or to the, the code for the project, writing plugins, all, all of that. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. And I'll, I'll talk about some of that next week. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so then that brings us to, uh, to the most important point of the webinar. <laughs> no, I'm joking. The geo beers. So uh, you're allowed to unmute yourselves or uh, switch on your screen. And uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for joining. And uh, let's, let's get on with the, with the discussion over, over some beer or coffee, breakfast, lunch, whatever, where, where in the, on the globe you are at the moment, in which time zone. So uh, as tradition, I'm going to open my, my beer here. And